Okay, welcome. We are here to go over the class feedback of the week three. Week three, uh, you know, student survey. And then also I like to go over the interesting and muddy points uh, from the interesting and muddiest points assignment. So first off, class feedback. Uh, 11 students did that. Uh, you seem to be all, uh, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, familiar with online courses. <clears throat> Only one student said that this is their first totally online course, but I believe they had some hybrid co uh, classes, so that's good. The class is as expected. Oh, there you see that's what happened there. And generally the students like the class, but for both of those, uh, there's a lot of agree and disagree or neutrals uh, and maybe one or two more uh, agrees than disagrees. So uh, pretty mixed, okay. Uh, the likes for the class, uh, the quizzes that you can take them over again. Uh, the content is interesting. You like that it's asynchronous and that you can work on your own pace. Uh, you like the dis some people like the discussions, uh, the discussion boards, uh, because what you can do then is you can find out what other students are thinking and uh, you know talk to other students. And then uh, the videos, uh, dislikes, uh, the number of assignments, and the due date uh, schedule. You're unsure about the due dates. Uh, number of the assignments. Uh, don't really think that for an uh, online class, that's extremely high. Uh, we're going to be settling down uh, now into about one new online discussion board every week. But what I do is I spread them out across two weeks so that students have more than enough time uh, to really consider what's going on and, and respond. So uh, one discussion board per week doesn't really sound that hard. And then uh, reading uh, and then maybe a video lecture. Uh, remember that this is an uh, online class, so we don't have in-person meetings. And that's uh, three hours a week of extra time, if you want to think about that. Uh, the due dates, uh, and you're unsure about the, the schedule. Uh, let me do this. I think I can do this. Keep an. I always need to remember. No, I don't want to keep annotations. Okay, here's uh, Blackboard, and we're talking about uh, the due dates. So even though, uh, like I said, I had uh, a virus last week, so I kind of got a little behind. But in general, what I'm doing is that I am posting all the assignments on the calendar. And this is a, in addition to uh, in the uh, you know, assignments uh, folder. So uh, let's see, here we are on the 21st. So you know, I posted that the academic were dark red. Our class is dark red. Uh, academic integrity, a quiz was due last night. Uh, and then uh, tomorrow, Wanted to let you know I'm having some office hours, and you can go there for office hours. And then uh, the job uh, analysis assignment is due uh, Tuesday night or tomorrow night. And then Wednesday we start a new week, and uh, then what will be due after that is the follow-up to the uh, job uh, analysis assignment. and. Uh, the beginning of the reliability review assignment. And even though we have two assignments on the same day or in the same week, one is a follow-up of uh, the one that started last week uh, or will be due tomorrow. And it's just that I'm giving you, instead of half the week to do uh, the first part of the you know, job analysis assignment, uh, and then the other half of the week to do the uh, other half, the review or the reply for the job analysis assignment, uh, you know, I'm spraying it out so that you have more time to respond. In the past, in past classes, students seem to appreciate that more. And then you see here, 
that's for my other class, so don't worry about that. And uh, so the next thing that we have to do after that next week would be Countdown Part uh, 1, which is due an odd day Friday, but I have it listed here. And then you see everything else uh, I have listed. So that's one way to look for where things are. If you go over to Assignments, and Blackboard is running slow this week, Weekly Assignments, Okay, so uh, I put the dates of when the uh, you know folder is active, and so today's the 21st, so we're just finishing up this week here. And then uh, I try to list in at least a couple places, unless I screw up, and if I screw up, you can uh, ask me about that. Uh, I try to list when things are due. So uh, fairly easy to see when uh, things are due. All right, so was that the end of... Yep, so that was the end of the class feedback. I had one of those when I was about that size. Okay, so let's look at your interesting and muddiest concepts. Uh, the most interesting uh, was on survey methods, uh, questionnaires, yes. And, uh, you know, the student says that I said that they're not as reliable. And actually, that we now know is a technical term, uh, meaning reliability. And I may not have said in the videos that uh, they're not as reliable because that's a technical use of, of the term reliable, uh, but I was probably commenting on the different types of validity. Uh, internal validity, external validity, ecological validity. Uh, and you have to understand that there are some problems with surveys in terms of uh, their uh, you know, in, uh, you know, internal validity, uh, in terms of whether or not subjects are responding to what you think they're responding or they're responding to something else, such as, for example, social desirability. Uh, there are some surveys, some questions that you ask can ask that you can be guaranteed not to get a accurate answer, and I'm using that term correctly here. Uh, for example, uh, asking people about their criminal behavior and their ethical behavior. Uh, how many people in here, I always love to do this in an in-person class, how many people in here stole something uh, worth uh, less than $25? And nobody will raise their hands, but we all know that we've done that. Uh, how many people here have had sex with somebody uh, of their own gender? and maybe one person will raise their hand in a class. Uh, but we know that that is a much higher value. And again, people are censoring themselves and presenting socially desirable responses, even on pencil and paper uh, surveys. So you are exactly right with that uh, you know, interesting observation. Uh, someone said that uh, the example experiment on violent cartoons was interesting. And here's the funny thing, uh, I made up that experiment so it would be easy for you to understand uh, the real experiments on the association between uh, violent media and uh, you know, aggressive behavior are much more complex. And this, I think, illustrates the importance of understanding research methodology at a high degree uh, so that you're not just understanding example experiments, but you can actually go and access the real thing and see what they're doing today in that area. And you're only able to really see the cool stuff if you understand research methodology. Uh, and then one student said the most interesting concept is the realization that there are infinite possibilities with experiments. Uh, because you could have more than one independent variable. 
That is, if you have a different independent variable, that automatically becomes a different experiment? Yes, it actually a absolutely does. Uh, and changing the way that you measure the dependent variable will make it a different experiment. Changing the way that you operationally define the same independent variable will make it a different experiment. And uh, these are you know, concepts that are so often used in research methodology that we have specific names for them. So yes, indeed, uh, it is infinite, infinite in terms of the different possibilities of experiments. Uh, the muddiest, uh, let's get to our muddiests. Uh, the least clear about lesson was the confound variable. And students always have difficulties with confound variables. I did not understand what was meant by one level of the independent variable being associated with one level of the con uh, confound variable. In order to have a confound variable, uh, there has to be two levels of an independent variable. And the answer is yes. That is, first off, there's two yeses here. The first yes is you must have two levels of an independent variable to have an experiment. And if you don't have at least two levels of an independent variable, you don't really have a variable. Variable means different. It takes on different values. And so an independent variable such as light level in a factory well, to be a variable, that means that the light level has to go to different levels. And so you have to have at least two high or low light levels for it to be a variable. Uh, if you don't have at least two levels of an independent variable, it's not an independent variable any longer. It's not a variable. It's a constant. And so, yes, indeed, uh, you have to have at least two levels of an independent variable. Uh, to have an experiment and then for the possibility of a confound uh, you have to have uh, at least uh, you know different levels of a confound that can co-vary that is change systematically in the same way with the changes in the independent variable and I'll illustrate that in just a second so uh, let's take a look at uh, our example experiment again, uh, where we're having six-year-olds, and boy, this blue, this red does not show up that well on the red. So we have six-year-olds watch uh, either a control video or six-year-olds watch a violent video. Uh, and then uh, we have two raiders record the aggressive acts during a 30-minute recess. Again, we have the same thing. And then uh, we have five uh, you know, recorded incidences of aggression during recess for the control condition. And we have nine incidents of aggression during the experimental condition. Uh, however, we only had uh, you know, two researchers. Uh, so we could only do this experiment uh, one at a time. Uh, so what we did is we ran the control condition in the morning kindergarten class and the experimental group in the afternoon kindergarten class. Uh, so uh, you know what we're doing is we're varying the time of day and everything else that goes along with it. So Let's say that we did this experiment this way, and you have to think about all the factors regarding how you do an experiment. Uh, so here we have the two conditions. Uh, this is the independent variable. We have the violent video, and we have the nonviolent video. Uh, this is one level of the IV. This is the other level of the IV. And now we see we have two levels of an extraneous variable, time of day. And as you can see here, this extraneous variable, uh, it is confounded with the levels of the independent variable. <clears throat> so
So that is, the time of day is changing, so it's a variable. It's not the IV or DV, so it's an extraneous variable. And then finally, it co-varies uh, with the uh, independent variable level, so it's a confound. And so, uh, time of day is confounded with the uh, level of the independent variable. And what does that get us, having something confounded? Well, look at uh, the dependent variable, or the results for, on the dependent variable. Uh, so let's interpret I chose the wrong eraser so I have to go all over the place doing this there there we go there we go oh get you there come on now I know that we have to click pen twice so let's interpret the results of this experiment uh, so one way to interpret it is that, well, there are fewer acts of aggression. I wanted my pen. There are fewer acts of aggression after watching the nonviolent video and more acts of aggression after watching the violent video. So therefore, one thing we can conclude is that our hypothesis that watching violent videos will cause more aggression in children is supported by the results of this experiment. But notice, because we have a confounded extraneous variable, there's another interpretation. Uh, students in the morning are less aggressive than students in the afternoon. Uh, and, yep, that's absolutely true. Why is that? Maybe the students in the morning are sleepier, uh, maybe the students in the afternoon are more awake. Uh, maybe uh, the students in the morning are different in that somehow when you uh, had the uh, schools choose, uh, you know, the morning versus the afternoon students, there was some selection bias in uh, the parents who signed their kids up for morning or afternoon. So maybe there are some significant differences between the types of students. We don't know, uh, but we don't know what really is causing these changes. Is it the independent variable or is it the uh, extraneous variable here which is confounded? We just don't know. And so uh, this is the slide from the that lecture I just, you know, that I stole this from. Uh, and just, you know, summarizing a lot of stuff. The IV, uh, it, it varies, but it's manipulated by the researcher. The DV varies, but it varies in response to the IV, we hope. Uh, and time of day varies also. And think about all the other extraneous variables. Uh, weather, temperature, children's energy level. Uh, so let's say that we redo this experiment to avoid this confounding. That's what this will look like then. Uh, we would have an experiment done at 10 a.m. both times and so what we would do is we'd have uh, we'd go to a morning kindergarten class we would randomly select 15 uh, you know six-year-olds we would take them to a special room to watch the video uh, they watch the video they go to a special recess area and they would have 30 minutes of recess and we would have two raters watch them uh, we would have another group of researchers at 10 a.m. They would randomly select 15 six-year-olds from a group. And that group of 15 six-year-olds would go to a room, watch the violent video. Then two other raiders would watch them uh, while they're on uh, a separate recess area for 30 minutes and rate them. And you can see why one reason hopefully why somebody would consider doing a confounded experiment like this one because it's easier uh, you just basically go to a morning classroom use everybody in that classroom and show them the video and then you and your partner are the 
uh, observers and then you hang around and come back after lunch and show the other video and you and your partner hang around and observe them uh, you know during recess you don't have to worry about different groups you don't have to worry about different rooms you only need to have two researchers here you probably need to have four researchers at least and so uh, that's one reason why you would want to do this type of experiment because it's easier but unfortunately it's confounded so it's just worthless and so in reality any type of experiment would be like this one which has better controls of extraneous variables because every experiment is going to have an extraneous variable uh, but as long as they're non-confounded they're not going to go bad okay so I you know just reviewing you know in the original experiment the time of day was the confound because it co-varied with the level of the independent variable uh, morning control afternoon violent and uh, this is just what I said before uh, draw a conclusion about the hypothesis in this confounded version of the experiment you don't know which hypothesis is actually being supported and so since you don't know that uh, you have no way of making a conclusion uh, at least with any confidence and we're not going to go through all this trouble to say something that you think kind of is okay or maybe is okay you want to know for sure that's why we're doing experiments and that's why we don't like confounds all right so another muddiest concept uh, you know there can be so many uh, different you know variables well you got to remember and I've already said this extraneous variables these are variables that are anything but the IV or the DV remember extraneous means an outside you know outside so if you hear uh, like a, a motorbike go by during my uh, video today that's an extraneous noise it's an outside noise extraneous variables any variable that's not the IV or the DV and if you think about it a whole lot of variables are extraneous and that's okay uh, in research methods I spend a lot of time explaining to students why extraneous variables are good and a lot of time explaining to why they're bad uh, so extraneous variables are both good or bad just depends on the situation once they become confounded that is once they co-vary with the IV then uh, the extraneous variable is a problem it destroys your experiment uh, now the experiment lacks internal validity. Uh, how do you fix something when you have extraneous variables or you have actually a confounded variable? Well you fix it by manipulation. That is being able to manipulate the independent variable uh, you know is one major thing that we can do uh, to uh, uh, control for extraneous variables and prevent them from becoming confounded. And in fact, laboratory experiments or experiments where we manipulate the independent variable, they are much more trustworthy than uh, you know, observational experiments where we just observe the relationship between an IV or a DV. Because there we have no manipulation, and that leaves us open towards extraneous variables becoming confounded without us knowing it. Uh, control of conditions. Uh, so the more control I have over conditions the more I can actually delete extraneous variables and uh, you know psychology has a scientific background and so uh, you know if you go to some psychology labs back back in my college in our one of our psychology labs we had like six glass booths they were amazing very expensive they were soundproof uh, they were I think Faraday shielded so uh, electrical some signals couldn't pass through they were temperature controlled why uh, the outside so sounds is an extraneous variable you don't want them to become confounded with condition well you 
control them, you stop them by putting people in a soundproof booth. Temperature, you know, uh, 68 degrees in one condition and 75 degrees in another condition, that's an extraneous variable. Uh, you don't want it to become confounded, so you control it. Uh, so now everybody is at 69 degrees. So that's, you know, uh, gets rid of that extraneous variable. So that's another thing that you can do. And then we always say when we're talking about the big three of uh, controlled experiments, random assignment, we're talking about random assignment of participants to conditions. Uh, and that's always thrown in because it's important because if you think about it, participants are a, an extraneous variable. And so how do you prevent participants, which are extraneous, that is, they differ from being confounded with the IV? Simple. You uh, randomly assign them to condition. OK, so a lot of questions about the definitions of reliability and validity. Uh, so here's a very basic chart. Memorize it. And that's your first step at uh, really understanding the difference. So reliability. The nickname of it is measuring the same thing twice. Uh, validity, its nickname is measuring what you intend to measure and nothing else. Uh, you know, uh, another way of thinking about uh, reliability is that it's a lack of error in your measurement. That is, whatever uh, me uh, me measure you're using has the least amount of error possible. Uh, validity. Uh, the idea that the test score that you see uh, is equal or as close to being equal to the construct in your head that you think you're measuring. If you're measuring masculinity, that is a score uh, on the M scale, the masculinity scale of the BSRI, that should be tapping into the real thing, which is a person's ma sense of masculinity. So validity means you're measuring what you want to measure. Uh, reliability, reliable, if somebody's reliable, they're trustworthy. And if a test is trustworthy, that means that you can, te you can trust it. Uh, if you get a score from it, you know that score is uh, a good score, that is there's a lack of error. Uh, valid, valid means truth, uh, so a valid test is truthful. Uh, that is, it's telling you what your masculinity is and not what your social desirability is, because that would be a lie if it was measuring some other construct other than masculinity. And then how do we know uh, whether a test is reliable or not? Uh, we do test, retest, reliability, split halves, multiple forms, or comb back alpha. And how do we know that a test is valid? Uh, we do a uh, divergent and convergent validity, and that's how we know. So again, memorize this chart. It's your first step in understanding. Uh, a student asked about accuracy, and they kind of confused it or conflated the term with reliability. And actually, uh, accuracy is a different term altogether. Accuracy means the agreement of a measure with a standard measure. Uh, so, for example, uh, I have a meter stick, and that's how I can measure the length of something. Uh, but you can say, well, how accurate is my meter stick? Was it created correctly? Uh, has it shrunk over time? Uh, has it, you know, stretched out over time? Uh, is it really a good measure of what a real meter is? Well, uh, we can actually figure that out because in uh, Paris, there is the standard measure of a meter, and we could take anything there and we can stick it next to it, and we can see how accurate my measure of a meter is compared to the standard measure of a meter. And accuracy, and I put it on this slide, is not a term we often use in testing in psychology because then we have to know exactly what we're talking about. And uh, in psychology, we're measuring things like uh, masculinity, IQ. Uh, we can't open up people's heads 
and compare our test score with what's inside somebody's brain. It's just ridiculous. So in many cases in psychology, we don't know what the real thing is. And we have to do our best to try to measure things, uh, you know, uh, given that reality. And another student asks, I understand that validity is accurately, and there's that term again, accurately measuring uh, to find the most constant answer. But what is confusing is how we uh, know what the true answer is. We don't know what the true answer is. And this graphic of the uh, you know, theory of uh, you know, true ability is pretty accurate. Up here in the clouds or in our minds are the concepts of a true score, that is your true intelligence, and random error. And then when you take an IQ test, that's the observed score. And we just have the, absor absor uh, the observed score, and we don't know what your true ability is, and we don't really know what error is. Uh, and so then, well, why are we doing that? Well, we do know that if we have two test scores, that is, if we give you an IQ test one day and we give it to you another day, uh, Ideally, we can imagine that your true ability, your true level of IQ is not changing uh, from one day to the other. So that's going to remain constant, so this T is always going to equal that T. The only changes we would expect would be error. And so we look at the relationship between uh, you know, your test score on one day, your observed score on one day, and your absor absorbed, uh, absorbed, observed score on the second day, and the minute changes we see between those two observed scores will be probably due to error. Now, looking at it in just two days or two observations really doesn't give us enough to really work with that. And so that's why when we do reliability, we look at, you know, uh, dozens or hundreds of test scores uh, from people. And uh, this gets into the idea of coefficient of determination, uh, which is, uh, you know, somebody asked me about the, the math behind that, and it's simple. The math is we just take r, and it should be little r really, and we square it, and that gives us the coefficient of determination uh, that is uh, the amount of uh, concept in one score and the other score that are shared. And uh, unfortunately with the pandemic, uh, you know, the textbook that, uh, from graduate school that I have with a really great slides and really great uh, illustrations is in my office and I can't get to it, but fortunately I found something similar uh, you know, on the internet. So we have the true score, which we really can't measure, and then we have the score on the test, and then you do a test retest uh, reliability. So what happens is you uh, take the test again, and then what happens is you have error on one day, and then you have error on the other day, and there's no relationship between these two days in terms of error. So error on one day is going to be different than error on the other day. The true score is always going to be the same. So the true score is related to your observed score on one day by a correlation, R, which we can't do because we don't know what the true score is. And likewise, it's related to another R, uh, which is your true score the other day. And so, if you wanted to observe, if you wanted to know what the measure of the test score with the true score is, all we'd have to do is take R and multiply it by itself, R. And of course, when you multiply R times R, you get R squared. And that's where we get the coefficient of determination. That is the relationship between the two true score and the score that you get is just R 
or the correlation squared. Somebody asked me for the mathematics behind it. That's it. Uh, another muddy trait is the multi-trait, uh, muddy trait. Muddiest idea is the multi-trait approach. Uh, I like the contingency table, so that's why I present it like that. Uh, but then maybe that's compl uh, you know, making it too complicated. All we really need to do is talk about divergent and convergent validity. And these are the two things that go to make up uh, you know, construct validity, a measure of construct validity. Uh, that is the idea of divergent validity is that uh, two tests that measure different things should not be correlated well. And that makes sense if you think about it. Uh, if I take a test on masculinity and I take a, a test on IQ, uh, the concept of masculinity and IQ should not be correlated. You know, they're not related to each other. Uh, and so therefore, the scores on those tests should not be correlated very well with each other. The correlation should be low. Uh, but what if I take a test on masculinity and a test that measures my uh, agentic focus and your agentic focus is how much you like to act as an agent that is to do things and to make decisions and to solve problems and many people say that a major part of masculinity is being agentic and so well if masculinity and an agentic focus are related then they should tests of them should correlate together and so that's what the multi-trait multi-approach uh, you know uh, idea is we just basically look for different versions of the test different versions of the uh, test for the same topic and we correlate them and those correlations should be high and then we look for tests that measure different things altogether, and those concepts should be unrelated, so the correlation should be low, and that's divergent validity, and it should be low. And so for any situation, if you have a new test, or you have a test that you're trying to identify uh, its level of construct validity, uh, let's say, for example, uh, you have a new test, uh, the need for cognition, and so you want to, uh, you know, assess its, uh, you know, uh, you know, convergent validity. Then you need to find a similar construct, and so probably similar to need for cognition, that is the need to think about things, is a, the need for structure, need to have things organized. And so there is a test for need for structure. So we give people our test, the need for cognition test, and the need for structure, and we see how well they uh, correlate. And uh, they should correlate highly. And that would be convergent validity. Need for cognition, need for uh, you know structure should correlate high highly. Uh, and then let's say we take our need for cognition test and we look at a dissimilar construct, which is IQ. Uh, intelligence is something that should be independent, theoretically, of cog need for cognition. So there shouldn't be a very uh, strong correlation. So we give somebody the need for cognition test and the IQ test, and they should correlate low. If it doesn't correlate low for the divergent test and high for the convergent test, then you have bad construct validity. All right, and then uh, somebody mentioned Chromeback Alpha. And if you want, you can stop here because we're at the end. And if you don't like math or anything like that, you can definitely stop and just take my definition of Cronenbach Alpha is that it's some statistical procedure that gives us a measure of reliability. And uh, you can stop here and be happy. But if you want to know more, listen for another two minutes. So let's first review our measures of reliability. 
uh, we have test retest reliability. We give the same test twice at different times uh, to the same people. So we have like a class of 30 students. They come in Monday and we give them the IQ test. They come in Wednesday, we give them the same IQ test. And we correlate uh, their scores across the two times. Uh, and that gives us the information we need to correlate, to create uh, a correlation measure, which is a measure of reliability. Uh, another method for getting reliability is split halves. Uh, you take the same test once, uh, that is you get a bunch of students, 30 students in, you give them the IQ test once, and you feel confident that the items on your test are randomly distributed on the test in order. So what you do is you arbitrarily say uh, the first 50 percent of the test is test one and the second you know, part of the test is test two. Uh, you know, I'm putting air quotes around two and one. And so then you just correlate those two halves of the test with each other. That of course you can only do if truly uh, there is no uh, organization or bias within the test itself. And usually that's not the case. Alternate forms. In some cases, uh, when you develop a test, you want to develop different forms of it. Okay, that's cool. That's not done that often because you probably haven't heard of it. Uh, so you have two tests and what you do is people take the two tests at the same time and then you correlate the scores across the two different versions of the test. Uh, and if you think about it, this is very similar to test retest and split halves. All that we're doing is we're having people take a test twice conceptually and we're trying to figure out as many different ways in which we can do that. And there are uh, pluses and minuses, pros and cons for each one of these methods. Chromeback Alpha is different. It's purely statistical, so I can give you a test once, and from that test score I can calculate a reliability. Uh, and how do I go about doing that? Well, here's the formula, and as I said, if you don't like math, just turn off the video right now and you'll be happy. Uh, but if you do uh, think you like math, uh, here's what we do. Uh, we essentially, uh, you know, see is the average covariance between the items. And so the covariance between the items is how much each item is correlated more or less with another item. And we do that for every item. So if there are 10 items on our test. We take item number one and we kind of correlate it with item number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And then we take the average of all those 10 all those nine correlations. Uh, and that's what C stands for. And we do that for all the test scores. In reality, this formula is really complicated. And if you think about it, you know, split halves, we're taking one whole test and we're saying, okay, let's split it in half. But then we could do more if you think about it. We could take one test and we could split it into thirds and correlate the thirds. Or we could take one test and split it into fourths and correlate the fourths. Well, what we're doing with the Chromeback Alpha is we're taking one test and splitting it down to one item. And then we're correlating that one item with all the other items. So that's what C is here. It's just a measure of how much each item correlates with every other item. And they do that for all the items. And we have that on the numerator along with the number of items to give us a sense of scale. And then what we do is we look at the variance of the test and the covariance of the items and then the number of items to give us a sense of scale and then something to uh, unbias it uh, based on the calculus of what we're doing. 
And so what we're what we end up with is that we have uh, the average covariance above here, and then in the denominator we have the average variance and the average covariance. And so what this really is is the proportion of the covariance to the entire variance and covariance of the entire test. And so that's what the Kronbach alpha is. It's a proportion, a proportion of how much of the test is due to the items sticking together or correlating together. And that's all it is. And so that's the, the math behind it. Somebody asked about that. And of course, you know, I have to answer that. And so what we're talking about is how much of the test score is related to uh, you know, uh, the uh, test items being the same. And so if we have a Kronbach alpha of 90% or 0.90, that's considered excellent. And so what that means is the test score, 90% of it is based on the items sticking together and measuring the same thing and 10% is that the test is not measuring the same thing. And then we have this rubric here where, and you know I say, this is the line where everything else below here is really horrible. And the fact that you would see a, a table like this is one of the major problems in psychology today, but that is for psychology 430 and not for you folks. Okay, so that was uh, my response to your feedback. Uh, you know, any other questions, ask me on online office hours, and I'll try to you know give you the best answer possible. Bye bye.